brought to you by CGTN Europe. Hello, I'm Stephen Cole. Welcome to the Agenda podcast. The United States has a new president, but just what does that mean for Europe? After a tricky four years under Mr. Trump, are all sides ready to reset relations? I spoke to Ali Renison, head of EU and trade policy at the Institute of Directors, and Lorenzo Godogno, the former chief economist at the Italian Treasury, to see what they thought the new man in the White House would mean for transatlantic relations. With a shift in the administration in the States, uh, clearly in terms of... Uh, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, f form, it will change a lot. In terms of substance, it uh, remains to be seen. In other words, I think the underlying uh, problems in terms of global trade are still there. And certainly, they don't change with the change uh, of the US administration. But certainly, the confrontational stance introduced by Trump uh, will uh, disappear. And I think there will be a much more constructive uh, attitude by the US administration but the underlying substance remains the same. So the underlying uh, strategic uh, uh, issues uh, and uh, problems uh, remain unchanged. So I think there will be a need for many years of negotiations uh, uh, in order to sort out uh, existing pro uh, problems. And Ali Renison, uh, what we don't have is years. Uh, let's talk about the US-UK uh, trade deal. It's a critical time for that. What are the hopes for a swift deal to be done? Well, I think actually in terms of speed, that stopped being a priority for, for both sides, um, particularly even the UK. I think the UK will be glad of a, a respite of sorts, and that's because the US trade deal is politically um, contentious in the UK, particularly amongst the, farming, the, the farmers and the farming lobby. Um, so I think while negotiations will probably continue, although we know that um, President-elect Biden is not making lots of trade deals is a huge priority. I think the fact that negotiations have certainly started, those will continue, um, but perhaps at a slower pace. And I think you'll start to see other areas emerge for cooperation priorities between the UK and the US, particularly around um, climate change. Uh, the UK is not only hosting the G7, but also the uh, Climate Change Summit, the UN Climate Change Summit later this year. So I think those are kind of the areas we'll see more progress on than necessarily trade immediately. Uh, Lorenzo, the EU and, as you've indicated, the Trump administration uh, are loggerheads over a number of issues, not least aircraft subsidies. Will Biden, do you think, end that kind of attitude, end that trade war? Again, in terms of attitude, there will be a huge uh, change. In terms of substance, uh, I would say difficulties are still there. Um, we know that TTIP ended up very badly. And uh, I don't see that situation to change radically in the near term. It will take years. Um, I mean, the underlying problems are still there. And I think uh, negotiation will not be easy, even with a new administration in the US. And Lorenzo, again, The Economist, just one magazine, has been calling this a transatlantic rift. Would you call it a rift? And if so, how quickly can that be healed? Well, with the previous administration, certainly it was a rift. Uh, and with a new administration, I think there is an opportunity to re-establish strong ties, also from a trade perspective. But again, it will take time. And Ali, what will a Biden presidency mean for Brexit and trade and the UK? Well, I think certainly it's not a Trump administration which was enthusiastically pursuing a US-UK deal. Um, having said that, I think there are a number of common interests in areas where the UK wants to show that it can um, flex its post-Brexit muscle, uh, particularly on cooperating on different areas, whether it's relating to the relationship with trade on China, whether it's relating to, for example, um, uh, looking at some of the defense issues. You know, the UK really wants to reestablish itself. And I think when we hear from the British government talking about that its trade policy after Brexit is going to be a values-based trade policy, um, that's what it's hoping to appeal to with the US to some extent. Um, but the UK really wants to, I think, show that it can do things differently from the EU. And um, while there is some justification for that, I think you have business wanting to try and make sure that we actually prioritise what helps trade for the UK, not just what the UK government can do on trade to sort of present itself after Brexit. Are there any, Ali, natural opportunities at the moment for the UK outside the EU with the US? <laughs> 
Well, I think it's always going to be a sort of um, difficult relationship on trade simply because uh, a lot of British industry is a bit nervous about what uh, opening up to trade with the U.S. would look like. Now, having said that, I think in a number of areas, um, whether it's cooperation on multilateralism and other areas, particularly, I think, in the digital space, you know, the U.K. and the U.S., uh, they care a lot about, for example, intellectual property enforcement. So I think those are kind of areas to not only um, liberalize on, but actually work together on externally throughout the world. So I think digital will definitely be one of the areas where you see opportunities, um, but particularly in agriculture, that's going to still continue to be a contentious subject. And Lorenzo, that is a contentious subject, isn't it? Because Brussels is determined to hold Silicon Valley to account. Well, absolutely. I think uh, digital remains a very critical area, not only for the EU, but I would say for, for, for the whole world in terms of trade. I think this is going to be addressed uh, probably in the future, also uh, in terms of relationship between uh, the UK and the EU, because there are many areas, particularly in terms of data security and stuff like that, that uh, have remained open in the, in the deal that was signed at the end of last year. And, uh, Lorenzo, some German politicians are hoping to revive the transatlantic trade uh, and investment partnership, which was basically a rather ill-fated Obama-era uh, initiative. Uh, public attitudes on big trade deals seems to have soured a lot on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, do you expect any change under President Biden to that? Uh, I think the change in terms of attitude will be substantial. But the underlying problems that uh, the TTIP uh, uh, process uh, faced in the past are still there. And I think uh, some uh, uh, critical aspects, such as agricultural policies, are, uh, it will you know, still be very controversial. I think uh, there is one item that uh, will be uh, very high on the agenda of um, um, European authorities in the near term, which is taxation on uh, um, internet trade. And that is uh, going to be very controversial, especially with the US. Ali, uh, President Biden has been talking about um, his relationship, a patched up relationship with the British Prime Minister, will decide the destiny of the world. That's not me saying it. That's not Boris saying it. That's President ba uh, Biden saying it. Um, what do you expect from this triangular, new triangular relationship between Brussels, Boris and Biden? Well, I think it depends on who you ask. You know, in the UK government, there seems to be a lot more focus on competition with the EU rather than cooperation. And I think that hopefully under the aegis of Biden, you know, there's more of an emphasis on sort of triangulating and trying to find what some of those common interests are, particularly on the multilateral front. Um, you know, you've just seen, for example, the US wasn't particularly happy about the EU going and concluding a longstanding negotiation on investment with, with um, China. But at the end of the day, the EU is now pursuing this sort of quote unquote strategic autonomy on, on trade where it doesn't want to be relying on the US. So actually, it could emerge that the US ends up, the UK actually ends up being closer to the US administration in trying to do things in coordinated lockstep. Um, and the EU does its sort of thing rather differently. But, you know, and I think that's what the, the challenge of the question is going to be is how much of this uh, is going to be cooperation rather than just competition. And, and Lorenzo, uh, again to you, there are financial problems within the European Union. Uh, Post-Brexit, how much will there be a circling of the wagons in Europe? How much will they say, we've got to emphasise unity now rather more than trying to reach out across the pond? There is a massive uh, investment programme that has been launched uh, with European money. And, and I think in the near term, uh, making sure that this is effective and uh, successful is absolutely essential. So I think uh, trade for now, it's not really top of the European agenda. Although I think that Europe will continue to work with all uh, uh, international partners, US, but also China and the UK, to achieve a higher level of uh, uh, global integration. Ali Renison, how much do you read into President Biden's first visit outside uh, America will be to London? to visit Boris Johnson. Uh, is that significant? Is that a renewal of the special relationship? I think it's important to be seen 
in itself and also in the context of why why this is the first big sort of visit outside of certainly North America, because as you sort of imply, Biden is going to uh, see Canada first. But in terms of the overseas visits, you know, ultimately this comes down to the UK is also hosting the G7 uh, presidency summit. And so I think that's also sort of, you know, why that has to be seen in some context. Having said that, you know, and I do think we can't forget that uh, Biden did intervene when the sort of Brexit negotiations were going on around Ireland and Northern Ireland. That's very important to him. Um, but it's, you know, it's important to remember also that in the past, the UK, uh, President Joe Biden has really come out to bat for the UK in certain areas. Historically, we're going back to things like the Falklands War. He very much supported the um, UK in that side uh, proactively. And I think that, you know, Biden's role as a sort of consensus maker, um, you know, Brexit has now happened. And I think he has an interest in trying to bring together um, shared interests, shared values, and the UK fits that in a number of areas. The question is, is that as the relationship between the EU and the UK continues to develop, in this new post-Brexit uh, world, to what extent that's going to be a cause for concern outside of these waters. So, you know, a lot of this really depends on how the relationship between Brussels and London uh, occurs. But I think, you know, Biden really wants to be um, the person who brings people together. And so I think we have to be seen in that context. That's very optimistic, Lorenzo, isn't it? Biden wanting to bring people together. Are transatlantic relations going to be better under President Biden than under President Trump? I think absolutely, because uh, one of the first uh, moves that uh, President Biden will uh, will do is uh, on climate change, which has been a really um, a major divide between uh, the two sides of the of the ocean. And I think uh, that is a really a very important move uh, for for Europeans. Uh, so uh, there are areas where there will be a significant change. Um, other areas are remain controversial, and uh, the uh, strategic interest of the U.S relative to Europe uh, don't change much. But it's, uh, it's good that uh, the new administration places a lot more emphasis on multilateral organizations, because I think what was missing with the uh, Trump administration was the support to these organizations, which are the only one that can actually achieve results uh, uh, on an international uh, uh, stage on major issues uh, on trade, but also everything else. Ali Renison, same question to you. Well, I think, I mean, looking at it, uh, and Lorenzo is right to highlight sort of the climate aspect for that, you know, that is where the UK is probably hoping to, under Boris Johnson, put Brexit behind it as much as it can be able to. We know that, as Lorenzo mentioned, that relationship continues to evolve on, on trade in particular. Um, but the UK, I think, is very desperate to be seen to be a player on the international stage in these international fora. And that's why I think particularly also the UK hosting the Climate Summit presents it with an opportunity to sort of uh, leverage its role um, in sort of bringing people together. Uh, the big question in all of that is that, you know, will the relationship between the UK and the EU continue to be um, stable or will it sort of fall into disputes? Because I think the UK can only do so much to perhaps um, distract from its sort of uh, challenges with Brussels that will continue. So that's the view from Europe. But what's the mood music coming out of Washington, D.C.? To find out, I spoke to Michael O'Hanlon, Director of Foreign Policy Research at the Brookings Institution, and I asked him what he made of President Biden's insistence that he plans to focus on domestic issues for the first 100 days of his presidency. Certainly, any American president has to put America first. In that sense, what Donald Trump said was just belaboring the obvious. That would be true for any leader of any country anywhere on Earth. They always put their own country first. But I don't really think Joe Biden's going to be unilateralist in that regard. I expect that even on the COVID crisis and the immediate response, he will have an eye on global economic recovery, on global sharing of vaccine capability, on increasing vaccine availability, not only in the United States, but around the world. There's no way to respond effectively to a global health crisis or a global economic crisis without taking a worldwide perspective. So I'm a little more hopeful that this will be, in fact, uh, even with the focus on the United States, a multilateralist approach towards doing so. So uh, a very big world out there for a new president, and uh, certainly, you're right, global challenges. Does that mean... Uh, Europe, the view of Europe from Washington isn't all that important at the moment. The Biden administration will certainly feel that it's time to repair relations with Europe or do what we can here in the United States after four years of an extraordinarily disruptive Trump presidency, which was really unprecedented in the 
acrimony that it interjected into the transatlantic relationship, and often pointlessly so, often for little positive policy impact. You know, there were some issues and issue areas where even if Donald Trump was improvising and being impulsive and often quite belligerent, he still may have shaken things up in a way that can create some new opportunity. For example, on the U.S.-China relationship, where I think some degree of disruption was needed, even if Trump himself didn't find the right path forward. But on Europe, I really feel that Trump just was just needlessly petty, and a lot of his policy uh, initiatives or pronouncements were pointless. And I think the Biden team would agree with what I just said and would look to restore a degree of harmony in handling Russia policy and NATO policy uh, on trade issues. We will put them back in their proper perspective. There may still be disagreements, but we won't treat them as existential threats to the alliance or the relationship. So that's the basic tone and approach that I would expect from the Biden team in regard to Europe. You mentioned NATO there, Michael. Uh, you expect a very different approach to NATO from President Biden than that uh, from President Trump? Oh, absolutely. I was just, in fact, reviewing uh, an op-ed that I wrote four years ago with Kathleen Hicks, who's our incoming Deputy Secretary of Defense, if she's confirmed. And we expressed strong disagreement with what Trump had said about NATO. And it's true, as you know, that American presidents and Congresses in general complain about burden sharing, don't think that Europe does enough to carry its fair weight. That's true, in my judgment, but it doesn't mean that we should forget the enormous strengths that the most remarkable military alliance in history bring to all of us, really binding together 40 to 50 percent of world economic and military power even though uh, our original purpose is no longer there in the form of a Soviet threat. Uh, I think this is extraordinary. I think it's very stabilizing for world power politics. It's beneficial on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. And, and I certainly think that that will be the overall tenor. And, you know, you can point to specific things the Trump administration did that were not all bad in regard to NATO, uh, the increased U.S. troop presence in Poland, support for the enhanced forward presence uh, capabilities that other NATO allies have brought to the Baltic states, the uh, sustaining of sanctions on Russia, even though Donald Trump himself didn't always seem enthusiastic about that. So there were elements of Trump policy that are not completely out of line and don't need to be reversed. But the overall atmosphere and tone and the sense of needing and benefiting from each other, that will be restored, I think, during the Biden years. And another approach will be crucial, that of the attitude and approach to Russia. Will that differ at all? What will President Biden's um, view be of President Putin? Well, here I'm a little bit of a critic of all the conventional wisdom in Washington, even predating Donald Trump. And I think that expanding NATO into the former Soviet space is a mistake. We should not do it anymore. We need to combine the existing Minsk II process on Ukraine, which, as you know, is going nowhere, with a broader vision of how to think about the neutral and non-aligned countries of Eastern Europe and try to create some kind of accord with those countries and with Russia that we're going to essentially create a safe space, a neutral space, where we're not going to try to bring Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, uh, but we are going to insist that Russia keep its mitts off and treat those countries as sovereign entities. That's the kind of vision I hope the Biden team would come up with and the rest of NATO as well, because as you know, NATO as an alliance is somehow committed to expand into the former Soviet space going back to 2008. I think that's a big mistake. I think it's the wrong policy. And I do hope the Biden team will want to work with NATO partners to reassess that approach towards Russia. But I don't yet know how to make a prediction. Uh, I'm not sure that'll be likely under the Biden team. OK, let's, let's move, Michael, to Iran. Uh, two conflicting approaches to sanctions and a nuclear deal in Europe and the U.S. What will President Biden's approach be to Iran? Well, my own fear is, if anything, Biden will be too quick to want to agree with Europe on this matter. I'm not in the Trump camp, certainly. Uh, but I do think the Iran nuclear deal, which, as you know, starts to, uh, starts to expire within two years, at least some of its restrictions on Iranian nuclear activity, start to be relaxed in 2023, and then again more of them in 2025. I think that makes the deal somewhat problematic. And rather than just return to it unconditionally, we should try to extend the deal, uh, you know, and get Iran to agree to an indefinite extension. Now, Iran's going to protest and say that that's going back on our word. 
Uh, but I think that, frankly, there are no nuclear nonproliferation deals that ask for good behavior only for a certain fraction of time, after which countries are unrestrained. Now, the Iran nuclear deal does have some stipulations that extend beyond 2025, and it certainly doesn't invite Iran to develop a nuclear weapon even after that date. But I still think the time horizon becomes problematic when you're already in the year 2021. So on that one, I actually hope that Biden takes at least a small dose of the Trump medicine and tries to extend the deal rather than just unconditionally return to it. However, my expectation is what I just said will not be Biden policy and that, in fact, he will return to the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as most European countries would wish, and that he'll do so very soon. Now, let's turn to Brexit. There have only been two big stories in Britain in the last two years, Brexit and COVID. Uh, in terms of Brexit, uh, President Biden didn't like Brexit, and traditionally, uh, America has wanted uh, a British voice at the European table to represent America. If nothing else, uh, Obama came over and told Britain to vote to stay in the EU. Uh, there was criticism from President Biden. Does that have any impact now, or is that part of campaign rhetoric? Uh, and it's passed, so we'll just get on with a new deal. I hope he just gets on with it. Obviously, the British get to choose their own uh, foreign policy associations. I'm not sure it made much sense for President Obama to publicly ask for one vote over another. You know, if, if somebody did that here, we'd probably be crying foul that other countries were trying well, to Well, they did here as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm just not sure that's the best policy, even if you have a strong viewpoint or preference. But what's done appears to be done. And I think we need to remember, historically, the United States and Britain have had a strong relationship way before the words European Union were ever even uttered. And there's no reason to think that this relationship needs to weaken. It'll be different. It'll be a little more complicated. And it may indeed um, com you know, complicate our relationships with the European Union. But we've got a lot of good friends still in the European Union as well. And so I just think it is, as you say, time to move on, recognize that other countries make their choices. And we still have fantastic partners in Europe, even if they're organizing themselves slightly differently than before. And the good news is that climate change is back on the U.S. agenda, with President Biden promising to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. How might the U.S. and EU and U.K. work together for a greener planet? That's a great question. You know, it's going to be easy for Biden to get a quick win on that and just say, I'm back in Paris. And uh, aren't we Americans now wonderful again? We're all multilateralists. We're rejoining international accords. We rejoin the WHO and pay our dues. You know, that's all the easy stuff. And as you know, the, the stakes and the magnitude of the global warming challenge are much greater than anything Paris could address or would address. And so the big question is going to be, do the uh, gas-guzzling Americans, and I count myself in that category, <laughs> do we get serious in, in any kind of policy sense uh, beyond just signing a piece of paper? And the good news is that technology is helping, as you know, whether it's renewables or gas, fracking, et cetera. But we have so far to go, and the planet's warming up. You know, one more winter here in Washington, we're not having any snow, and it already feels practically like spring is just around the corner. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that the climate has changed enormously, and just joining Paris, which at best slows the previous trajectory by a few percent, that's really not enough. So this is where Biden's going to have to decide: does he do something much more serious, um, let's say, you know, by this summer or fall, and really try to interject a big change that would potentially cost some Americans at least some money in greater taxes or higher energy bills? Or is he going to be content with a more symbolic rejoining of the Paris Accord? I don't know the answer to that. That brings us to the end of another edition of the Agenda podcast. Next week, we take off as we look at attempts to put another man on the moon. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher and Spotify. You can also find us on CGTN Europe, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve?
Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.